Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Catherine Doe, a product marketing director here at Equifax for our risk portfolio. Economists have begun ringing the alarm about an impending recession, and as a result, banks are raising rates and tightening lending standards, and many consumers are feeling the squeeze. In today's episode, we'll discuss how lenders' new credit policy changes are impacting consumers. We'll also reveal how lenders can navigate this credit tightening environment. Jesse Harden joins us with insights on both of these topics, and he's a risk advisor here with us at Equifax. Welcome, Jesse. Thanks, Catherine. Glad to be here. Yeah. Before we begin, let's get a brief economic update from David Fieldhouse, Director of Consumer Credit Analytics at Moody's Analytics. David? Thanks, Catherine. The economic calendar gets busy this week. We're going to get data focused largely on the consumer and inflation. We're also going to get real personal spending data, and our expectation is for personal spending to remain constant. We're excited to get the first quarter estimate of GDP. Now, that's going to be subject to change. We're still waiting for a couple data points to come in, but right now our expectation is that real GDP will have risen in the first quarter at an annualized pace of 2.1%. It's important to emphasize that GDP is backward-looking, and the first quarter reading is unlikely to tell us much about the economic fallout from last month turmoil in the banking system. So so where are we heading? Well, it's hard to argue for an improvement in consumer confidence. The stock market has been a bright spot so far, but gasoline prices have been trending up and initial jobless claims are creeping higher. We need to monitor the recent trend in claims for unemployment insurance benefits. There has been a clear upward trajectory in initial UI claims since the beginning of February. So the four-week moving average has risen from about 200,000 per week to about 240,000 per week. The new elevated path of UI claims also is aligning with other data that we're seeing in actual layoffs and job cut announcements. To to put this in perspective, we estimate the break-even level of claims to be about 265,000, which is the level where the economy is not really gaining or losing jobs. So we're still gaining jobs at, at the moment. But if claims creep up much higher, we'll be at that break-even level, which is really pointing to a weakening economy. The new signs of this weakening, though, may be welcome news for the Federal Reserve, as the softening labor market will be key to slowing wage growth and taking some pressure off of core service inflation. While the Fed looks like it's poised to raise interest rates again at the next FOMC meeting in early May, they may not deterioration that we're beginning to see. Thanks, Catherine. Back to you. All right. Thanks, David. Thanks for setting the stage for our discussion today. So, Jesse, I'd like to dig a little deeper into labor and consumer spending. Will we continue to see enough strength in these markets and areas to keep the economy out of recession? Yeah, good question, Catherine. So the worker and consumer have kept the U.S. out of recession so far. If you look at unemployment right now, we're at historical lows. Job creation is near all-time highs as of late last year. And and really, we've seen strong growth in personal consumption during and after the pandemic. And so the economy has been fairly resilient when you factor in the headwinds. You think of a pandemic, geopolitical tensions, and inflation higher than we've seen in multiple decades. So the real question, like you asked, is how long can this last? And so recent labor market data shows that the economy is still creating new non-farm payroll jobs. Additionally, we see in sectors like hospitality, healthcare, government, and professional services, we're still moving along. Where we see some pullback is in sectors like manufacturing, construction, and retail trade. And recent layoffs in the tech sectors have hit tech workers hard and those associated to geographic areas particularly hard. And so really looking at consumer spending, it's the same story. We've seen the strength in the pandemic. So, but what we know is that inflation makes it harder for consumers to make their ends meet. Um, Additionally, we've seen that consumers have their savings amount, which we saw build up throughout the pandemic and after the pandemic via stimulus and lockdown, those are starting to decline. So it doesn't take an economist really to see that this mixture is going to create a a greater burden on the consumer. And as a result, we've seen that the sudden delinquency is starting to spike in sectors like credit card, personal loan and auto. 
So this poses a real concern then for lenders as the results that they start to see in their portfolios are impacted based on those delinquencies. And so we are seeing that some of those lenders are starting to tighten access to credit. It can really then create a vicious cycle. So we see that the consumer needs access to credit to continue to purchase, but the stricter credit standards means that it's going to limit the, the lender's exposure. And it's just that vicious cycle of credit return. So mm. recent signs, then we see metrics, you know, consumer spending like the personal consumption expenditures index, it's really showing signs of moderation. So we're going to really need to watch things like the the Fed Senior Loan Officer Survey, which compiles information about whether or not banks are tightening or loosening their, their credit standards. And we can talk a little bit more about some of those best practices you know, to identify credit risk and then also how the consumers can grow in this challenging climate. Mm. And you mentioned credit tightening, and that's what I want to ask a little bit more about. Can you tell us a bit about the thought process behind credit tightening and, and why lenders are concerned about their policies right now? Yeah, you bet. You know, so as lenders begin to see challenges in the economy and things like rising delinquency rates, the natural instinct is that they're going to want to tighten their lending standards so that the lender has less exposure in their portfolio. And this can be exacerbated by events that we see in or the recent times, like the banking crisis that we just saw with some of the, the banks and liquidity issues. And small and medium-sized banks have really seen a flight of deposits into larger institutions, and that can have a pronounced impact on the liquidity at those banks. But the good news is that the issues don't seem to be systemic. The reality is there are some pockets in the economy where we're seeing increases in delinquency rates, as we spoke about, again, especially in that credit card scenario and even in auto where we're seeing some of the delinquency rates higher than we had in some of the, the previous recessionary periods. So the, the good news, though, is that the, the, the economy is still pretty healthy in terms of the credit climate. So the, the question then becomes for lenders, how do they balance the decision to tighten with the need to grow organically? I think the last guest you had on on the podcast was very succinct and put it very nicely when he said, we have to continue to have conversations with customers, continue to serve people and be a little more careful, but probably don't turn away people simply to protect capital. And I think that was you know very pointed advice. Mm -hmm. We've also seen companies that in times of economic downturn and credit tightening, they've grown their portfolio and you know they've really been smart about it, taking the contrarian path. So I think there are opportunities and it's just a matter of finding those. Maybe we can talk about the flip side of that for a minute. Can you talk about how this tightening impacts the consumer and what we may expect to see if we continue to see tighter credit? Yeah, sure. We talked about small and medium-sized banks, how they're pulling back on credit to preserve balance sheets and liquidity. So let's take an example then looking at credit tightening and the impact it can have on small business. So small businesses, they tend to find credit from smaller institutions, those regional banks, credit unions and medium-sized banks, where the credit really flows as a result of the relationship built between the small business and the smaller banks. And we know that the small banks, they have less available cash reserves and they tend to rely heavily on credit lines to fund future growth. Those small banks have been a significant provider of credit to the economy. And it's important really then to understand the small and medium-sized banks, they're responsible for about half of commercial credit lending and about half of consumer lending. So based on this, we know that any pullback that we see in small business lending via credit tightening by the banks is going to have a direct impact on small businesses, especially their ability to grow in the future. Conversely, larger banks, they're benefiting from those deposit inflows and they may not pull back as much. The consumer, though, as well, is going to equally end up being impacted during the credit tightening policy. And we know that inflation drove consumers to rely more on their credit products. And so as lending becomes harder to get, consumers are going to have less ability to rely on credit products for future purchases. So we may see some pullback in the economy, but it's most likely going to start with consumers on the lower end of the credit spectrum that are utilizing that credit to make ends meet. Mm. So we talked a lot about credit tightening, both uh, what that means for lenders and consumers. What does that mean for areas of opportunity for our lender community? Yeah, another great question. So, you know, overall, I would say that there are absolutely opportunities to find good new account prospects in times of economic downturn. We've helped customers in all credit sectors accomplish their goals in the face of headwinds. The key to success in a tightening economy is to understand and really look for customers who can manage additional credit. So looking at customers' credit durability is something that can really accomplish that objective. 
For example, Equifax, we have a product called Financial Durability Index, which looks at non-FCRA yes. data. Yeah, and I know you've talked about it before, mm-hmm. yeah. but it's, you know, so looking at non-FCRA data and looking at the capacity for that customer to handle additional debt. And it's important because there's good credit risks and bad credit risks in every credit score band. Mm-hmm. So what the tool does is it helps us define consumers who are those good credit risks in each score band. So as an example, a 720 credit score may have some customers in that score band that are heavily leveraged and they may perform very differently than other 720 scores. And conversely, there could be some in 660 credit scores who have a less leverage. And so the secret really in a tightening environment is to better understand the risk tolerance level, both at the organization for one, And then two is understanding the goals for growth in the organization and then really fully understanding the risk profile, both for new and existing prospects and and understand how those prospects are going to handle additional access to that credit. Mm. And that's a good plug for additional and alternative data, which we've talked about many times in this podcast. So thanks, Jesse. What else do you think may cause lenders to evaluate or reevaluate their credit policy and strategy with the climate right now? Well, it's, that's interesting because there's no shortage of things to think about. Um, yeah. You know, I think of it really in terms of a, maybe a book with three chapters. So I would say mm-hmm. chapter one is really driven by policy. You know, the Fed mm-hmm. has had to act because inflation is causing pain for the consumer. The Fed's job right now is it's tricky, though, because they have to figure out how to bring down inflation while they don't break everything else. So really, mm-hmm. to the crux of your question, you know, in terms of chapter one, and we talk about policy, it's really what lays ahead in the uncertainty of how much the Fed has to react to that high inflation. And so if we start to see cooling in the labor market and we start to see consumer spending fall off, we may see that there's going to be a halt to those Fed funds rate increases this year, which we expect. And that's going to have the effect of bringing down some of those borrowing costs. You know, we could see that there is a continuation in consumers being able to keep the economy out of recession. If we look then at chapter two, I would say chapter two is driven by the consumer. And so in terms of what lays ahead for the consumer, it's just the opposite kind of of what we talked about. So it's jobs. Do we see that the labor market continues on its pace? Do we see that consumer spending on things like automobiles and houses continue with with the consumer's ability to meet their debt obligations? Intuitively, consumers are more likely to meet their obligations if they're employed. So that employment number is going to be really critical to watch moving forward. And then as the consumer faces headwinds, you know, and job losses, if they really start to take hold, then we have to watch the consumer's ability to meet those demands. And that's going to be a, a key area of focus. And then I would say the last chapter of that book is, is what I would characterize as the unknown. So those are things like the banking crisis that we just saw. It's things like the upcoming debt ceiling battle or even when the student loan moratorium expires. So mm-hmm. geopolitical tensions, you know, energy yeah. prices, it's all those unknowns that are coming through. Mm-hmm. And the reality is there's, there's lots of those events that could happen. So, you know, as a lender, I would say that to, to monitor all three of those chapters and then really keep up to speed on which of those chapters are, you know, are growing. And that's where we're going to continue to see that challenge. Great advice. Thanks, Jesse. Love that it's in chapter format. <laughs> yeah, easy to, easy to access. Yes. Yep. Great. So as we wrap up our discussion, what other best practices might you recommend for lenders or have you recommended in your work as part of our risk advisor group? Just to minimize risk uh, and exposure right now, what, what, what are you yeah, sharing? Yeah, absolutely. And it's the one I'm, I'm most passionate about. So I'm not an economist. I just play one on TV. But <laughs> I would say that we know it's tough right now to find the right balance in credit policy. So if the policy is too strict, then we know that lenders can't reach their growth objectives. And if the policy is too loose, then we know that we have runaway credit losses. Mm-hmm. So right now, we're really encouraging lenders to focus on three key things. So first, we would say the best protection means that you monitor your portfolio. So it sounds very simple, but it's or or maybe even too simple to be true, but it's really not. It's understand what your portfolio looks like. And I think some lenders are scared to take a look. So to do this, I think lenders should be looking at, you know, getting access to office credit data. And office simply means it's just not their own data. It's outside data sources. So it could be credit data. It could be some of the alternative data that we talked about and really access that information through account reviews. I would encourage customers who are already doing account reviews to look at fresher data. 
you know, fresher data coming in means that you have a better understanding of how customers are performing on other forms of credit, not just on your own portfolio. And then if you're not doing account review, consider a semi-annual or even a quarterly credit append just to, to take a better look at how that customer's performing. And then with account reviews, things to look at. So look at delinquent accounts, look at late payments, look at new charge-offs. You can see changes in debt to income and payment to income ratios as a key driver. And then as well, looking at changes in income. And I think all of those are leading indicators of, you know, of consumer stress. Next, we'd also recommend looking at any behavioral models that you're using. So behavior models, they're a great way to understand how likely a consumer is going to act based on what you've modeled to. But you'd be surprised how rarely some model performance gets updated and looked at. So I would recommend, again, taking a fresh look at behavior models, performance, and doing sample validations to ensure that the performance is what we're expecting to see as a lender. And then if not, it might be time to enhance or redevelop those models or start fresh with a new model development. And then finally, what I would say is let's use all the tools available to better understand the credit picture for your prospects or existing customers. And as we said, lenders are playing a critical role in a well-functioning economy And so be open to finding those good prospects, you know, and those that can withstand additional debt, who can help the portfolio continue to grow and meet the the objectives in that tightening environment. So I'd say those, those three areas are ones that we would recommend just to every customer that we talk to. Awesome. Thanks, Jesse. Sure. And I'm going to add one more in here because it's always my my favorite question to ask. I know you talk to customers all the time and are advising. Do you think that there is anything that you're not being asked in your engagements as a risk advisor that you wish you were asked more or a bit of insight or or something that maybe lenders aren't thinking enough about that you would caution them to to take another look at? Yeah, it's a good question. I would say, you know, Lenders are asking us all the time, you know, what are what are our peers doing? Mm-hmm. And I think that there's always a natural curiosity about, you know, are, are peers looking at data more? Are they looking at certain types of scores more? So I would say that it's that it's asking for more information from sources like Equifax, you know, reach mm-hmm. out and understand. Like you mentioned, we talk to lenders every day about a myriad of, you know, of, of happenings in their portfolio. So, you know, reach out, reach out to some of the industry trade groups that mm-hmm. have critical information about how that industry is performing. And then I would say, personally, one of the things that I've come across is that there's a lot of talking heads and political punditry out Mm -hmm. there. We laugh about it, but certainly it's the case. And so I've told customers that you always have to know the angle that that story is coming at, because there's oftentimes a hidden narrative behind that story. And so that's why we tend to look at the raw data, because the raw data sometimes most of the times doesn't lie, but sometimes there's nuances with the data. So, so really mm-hmm. focusing in on what's the source of that information and how do I synthesize who's putting it out? So I think those are the questions that I would you know, be asking myself if I was in their shoes. Great. Thanks for sharing, Jesse. Um, and if our audience might like to follow up with you directly, where might they find you? Yeah, so we've got a, a nifty uh, email address. It's riskadvisors, and that's all one word, at equifax.com. And so if you get your questions there, we'll be happy to answer them in all industries. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Jesse. If you enjoyed today's episode, please tell your friends and colleagues about us and consider subscribing. If you'd like to send us any questions or suggested topics for future episodes, you can email our team at marketpulsepodcast at equifax.com. And don't forget to register for our Market Pulse webinar series. You can do that at equifax.com forward slash Market Pulse. We'll continue to provide relevant economic and credit insights to help your business make more confident decisions. Thanks again for listening and join us next time. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com. 